All right. So welcome to NOAA Science Camp, Camp's virtual programming. My name is Lisa Hiruki Baring, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. These webinars are a collaborative effort by NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where I work, NOAA's uh, Washington Sea Grant, and NOAA Fisheries Northwest Fisheries Science Center. NOAA Science Camp is a hands-on summer science program that in other years is held in person at our NOAA Western Regional Center in Seattle and is designed to show you how NOAA science touches your everyday life and how NOAA offices work together to address environmental issues. Since this summer we're online, we wanted to put together a series of webinars and activities to give you a look at NOAA's work on particular topics and how our scientists conduct research. So the webinars this week are designed to get, help you get to know about NOAA's work on marine mammals and the technology we use to study them and why we want to know the information that, that we're researching. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, studies the ocean and the atmosphere and where the two meet, from weather to ocean to the animals that live around us. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA or work in partnership with NOAA. We hope this gives you a sneak peek at different career paths that you might be interested in. Today, we're introducing you to Nicole Harris, who works for NOAA's Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary in Port Angeles, Washington, and that's out on the Olympic Coast. Um, sorry, on the Olympic Peninsula. Well, we'll be talking about NOAA's role in research and stewardship. We want to recognize that we're all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial Indigenous knowledge and much to share with us. Nicole's work on the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary is done in partnership with four coastal treaty tribes, the Nakwa, Kuliut, Ho, and Quinault, who have been stewards of their lands and waters for thousands of years. Nicole is presenting from the traditional lands of the first people of Port Angeles, the Kualum people, past and present. We also would like to acknowledge that we're hosting this webinar from the traditional lands of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present. A few guidelines before I hand you over to Nicole. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure everyone can hear our speaker. However, there's a box that you can write questions in. We encourage you to ask them as we go. I'll keep, be keeping track for, of questions behind the scenes for Nicole. She'll stop every now and again and answer a few questions. We might not get to all of our questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. All right, I'll hand it over to Nicole to introduce herself. Oh, Nicole, I think that you might be muted. Yes, I was muted. Thank you so much, Lisa. I'm really happy to be here today with everyone. I'm just gonna get my slide ready and thank you all for joining today's webinar. So. I'm just gonna tell you guys a little bit about myself first. My name's Nicole Harris. I'm coming to you today from my home in Port Angeles, Washington, where I am a marine science educator with NOAA's Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. So I fell in love with the ocean while I was working as a deckhand on a commercial fishing vessel in Southeast Alaska. Um, I grew up in Eastern Oregon, so I wasn't that far away from the ocean, but I didn't spend a lot of time there. And right out of high school, like a lot of students, I went right into college and I was pretty darn sure I wanted to be an elementary education teacher. After college, before kind of jumping into any sort of career, I spent some time planting trees with a crew in Central Oregon in the spring and then fishing in Alaska through the summers. And the ocean left such an impression on me when I was up there in the in the ocean with humpback whales as my neighbors and um, beautiful and delicious salmon all over the place um, that I went back to school later in life to get a degree in environmental policy and science, um, complementing my background in education. I worked for a few years as a nearshore biologist monitoring the nearshore ecosystem evolution with one of the largest dam removals in history, the Elwha dams right out here in Port Angeles before finding my place with Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, giving me the opportunity to marry my love for the ocean and science with education. Um, and I couldn't be happier. So I get to do really great things like um, today when I get to talk to you all about whale talk in Olympic Coast and the science of our ocean soundscape. But before we jump into all that, I wanna tell you all about some very special places, National Marine Sanctuaries. So NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries protects a network of underwater treasures encompassing more than 600,000 square miles of marine and Great Lakes waters. The network includes a system of 15 national marine sanctuaries and two marine national monuments. As you can see from this map, we have national marine sanctuaries on both the east and west coast 
those are designated by these little blue dots here. Um, we have national marine sanctuaries in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and we even have national marine sanctuaries in the Great Lakes, including our newest national marine sanctuary, the Wisconsin Shipwreck Coast National Marine Sanctuary. The red star there is where I work, Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. So Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary lies within the usual and accustomed waters of four coastal treaty tribes, the Macaw, Quileute, and Ho tribes and the Quinault Indian Nation, where they have lived and depended on the healthy resources of these waters for thousands of years. Designated in 1994, the sanctuary protects over 3,188 square miles of marine waters with a boundary that runs about 40 miles offshore up there in that northern part, and then it comes in and hugs the continental shelf. We have approximately 135 miles of coastline, some of it designated wilderness. In fact, Washington has one of the longest stretches of designated wilderness coastline in the lower 48 states. We protect a variety of marine resources. We have 29 species of marine mammals that live in or visit our sanctuary waters. It attracts some of the largest seabird colonies in the continental US. We have a rich maritime history with over 200 documented shipwrecks on our coast. And we have a diversity of habitats, some rocky and sandy intertidal, near shore kelp beds, submarine canyons, subtidal reefs, a whole bunch of open ocean. And we also lie adjacent to other federal and state protected lands, including Olympic National Park, National Wildlife Refuges, and state parks. So today, we are going to talk about the acoustics of cetaceans. And cetaceans are marine mammals of the order cetacean, so a whale, dolphin, or porpoise. Um, some examples of cetaceans are toothed and baleen whales like the killer whales or orcas and then humpback whales seen on these images here. And then acoustics is the science that involves sounds and sound waves. So let's start by diving into the science of acoustics, starting with sound and vocalization. So what is vocalization? Well, it is any audible communication between two organisms. So we as humans vocalize often through speaking to communicate with each other, but communication can occur without speaking, such as body language, like if I do this. You guys know what that means, right? When we wave to each other, that's a form of communication without speaking. Or in the case of whales, we'll often see peck slaps or fluke slaps. Those can be ways for whales to communicate. Whales vocalize with each other for multiple reasons. They vocalize to communicate like humans, but they also vocalize during feeding and in navigating the ocean. Vocalizations occur through vibrations that move through matter, which is made up of molecules. And then our brains um, decode those vibrations as sound. You can actually feel these vibrations. If you put your hand on your chest and say your name, Nicole, or hum, hmm. You can actually feel those vibrations inside your body. Sound travels as waves, and it travels as longitudinal waves. So if you were to stretch a slinky out over a flat surface and then compress one side, so just give it a little push on that one side, you can watch the compression travel through the slinky to the other side. This is an example of a longitudinal wave. So as the sound waves travel, our outer ear funnels sound from the air into our inner ear. Our ear canal receives those vibrations via the eardrum, which amplifies that sound. And then the vibrations pass through our inner ear, which is made up of three little bones. And from there, the vibrations are translated by our brains to make sounds. I know it sounds complicated, but that's okay. Um, it all happens just like this. But what about whales? Whales don't have the same structure as us. The inner ear is different for us and them, and even location compared to our anatomy is different. So look at the human skull on the left. We can see the ear cavity behind the connection of our lower jaw. 
But we don't rely on our lower jaw to pick up sound waves since we have this outer ear. And this outer ear kind of works as a funnel for all that sound. So now look at the whale skull, which is on the right hand side. From this view that we're looking at, we are only looking at the upper skull jawbone. The lower jawbone would connect near um, each of the ear cavity locations where those red arrows are. So the upper left hand image here is of a full humpback whale skull and the bottom right hand image is that partial, partial skull showing the ear canals that we saw. So you can tell that the ear canals and the jawbone are right next to each other when the full skull is completed. So we saw the difference between a human skull and a whale skull, but what about the ear? If you guys think you know, I'd love for you to put this into the question box, but we have an outer ear flap. Do you think whales have an outer ear flap? Go ahead and put your answer in, yes or no. Do you think whales have an outer ear flap? Lisa, do we okay. have any guesses? Yes, we are having answers pour in. I think that most of the people are saying no. Harper, Weston, Victoria, Juliet, uh, Jace, Theodore, Wyatt, Michelle, Carson, and um and uh Turum and Kiefer are all saying no ella mylan doria yeah so i think most people are saying no they don't have an outer ear flap awesome great job you guys the answer is no turns out whales do not have an exposed outer ear flap like humans interesting there are a couple marine mammals that do have outer ear flaps if you ever take a look at a sea lion or a fur seal um, they have outer ear flaps. So um, interesting anyways to look at that. So whales do not have an exposed outer ear flap and unlike our ears, you can see from this image here that their ear canal is not open to their inner ear. On the left is a diagram of a whale ear and on the right is a diagram of a human ear. Whales have this oily mucus that surrounds the inner ear. For humans, the inner ear is surrounded by bone look for other differences between the whale and the human ears and go ahead and type them into that question box if you guys make any observations differences or similarities um you know it's easy to see that there is quite a few similarities and there's also quite a few differences between the whale ear and the human ear so if you see any similarities go ahead and type in what you think that uh similarity is between the whale ear and the human ear. And also, if you see things that are different, go ahead and type that in. So Theodore is saying they both have a little spiral thing in the middle of their ear. Um, he said that it's a cochlea. He read the, read the uh, label there. Um, Charlie, Ollie is saying that the human ear looks like it's more spread out. Anne is saying that there's no eardrum. I guess that would be no eardrum in the um, whale ear. And Harper and Connor are saying that the human ear tubes are bigger, or they look like they're bigger, like relatively speaking. Um, Weston is saying whales only have an outer ear and no inner ear. And Victoria says that it differences, that there's a difference in that whales have a bulla and ossicles and humans do not. Wow, nice job, you guys. Those were some great observations. You nailed it. There are a lot of differences between whale ears and human ears. We know whales don't have that outer ear flap. The whale ears are, um, ear canals are curved. They have a bulla, like you guys pointed out. They, But then we also have a lot of similarities, right? You guys notice that we both have that cochlea, we both have ear canals, and we all have auditory nerves. I love comparing us to other marine mammals around this planet. So another difference between us and whales is that whales have a fat filled cavity located in their jaw bones and that detects those vibrations because they don't have that eardrum, right? So after sound travels through the jaw, it then heads to a compartment that is called the bola. And that's much like our inner ear. The bola is what eventually transmits the vibrations to the brain so that they can be interpreted as sound. So now that we know the difference between human and whale ears, we're gonna um, kind of switch gears a little bit and start learning about the difference between toothed and baleen whale vocalizations. 
But before we do that, we'll just take a quick minute and see if there's any questions that we can answer right now. Okay, so we do have a couple of questions that go right back to your introduction. Um, Weston and Shane were wondering, why is there a National Marine Sanctuary in the Great Lakes? Aren't those freshwater? That is a great question. Yes, those are freshwater, right? And we usually think of these marine sanctuaries as being in saltwater or the ocean. But sanctuaries are really put in place to protect diversity and culture and maritime heritage. And I don't know if you guys have visited those Great Lakes up there and those freshwater Great Lakes, but they're huge. And they actually support an incredible amount of diversity in life and in steward, uh, sorry, marine, um, in, uh, now it's escaping my brain, but in um, maritime history. Um, and those are very important for us to actually protect and enhance the understanding of those places in within National Marine Sanctuary. So really great question. And then um, Theodore was wondering, how do you get into the job of a deckhand on a fishing boat? Ooh, great question. It was one of my most favorite experiences in my whole life, actually. And um, every summer, there is um, a lot of fishing boats that have that go out of Alaska, several different ports. I was based out of Sitka myself, and my skipper was from Ock Bay. But um, I had a friend who had done it, so that's how I got involved in it. But you can actually, they um, fishermen will post for deckhands um, to try and get people to come up for the summer. It's a great opportunity to go out and really be intimate with the ocean and learn some really great skills and work really hard. Great. And um, Jason and David were wondering what marine, what other marine mammal, marine animals do you work with? Well, in Olympic Coast, um, much of the time I spend in the sanctuary is in that inner tidal. And so invertebrates are some of my favorite animals. I love tide pooling. I don't know if you guys have ever had the chance to go into that inner tidal area when the tide recedes and all of these areas are uncovered that are normally covered and you can find sea stars and anemones and barnacles. And my favorite animal of all in the ocean is the nudibranch, which is a sea slug. Um, so those are the ones we commonly work with. Our sanctuary also partners with a lot of other organizations in the area and agencies to conduct like, sea otter surveys. We don't, aren't interacting with any of those animals, but we're monitoring populations to um, have an idea of, of where they are, how big their numbers are, and what the health is. And they can help us determine some of the health of our ocean resources at the same time. Great. And then um, let's see. So Charlie had said, or Charles would say, had said, um, he wanted to confirm that whales hear better because sound is sound, as you said, is vibration. So it travels through water. Is that correct? The sound does travel for whales. Yep, it travels through water. We're actually going to talk about how sound waves travel through different states of matter in just a minute. But as you can imagine, um, whales spend you know, most of their life underwater. And so they've had to develop really good senses and hearing plays a very important role in how they feed, how they navigate, and then how they actually um, mate as well. So I think that is correct to say that they have very good hearing um, and they've evolved to make the most out of that hearing in their ocean world. Okay, and then I had a question from Marlon, which was, um, does the humpback whale have the same ear structure as other whales? Um, so the, yes, the humpback whale, the, the ear image that we showed was helping us to represent the humpback whale ear structure. Um, I would have to, I'd actually have to do a little research to see if that structure represented all whales, both baleen and toothed whales. But um, for the purpose of this presentation, that diagram was helping us represent the humpback whale ear. ear and then at and just as a side point, um, another thing that you could do after the webinar uh, for those of you on, on in our audience is that you could Google different types of whales and ear structure to see whether it's it's similar. So there's a, I think there are a lot of diagrams of different ear structures on, um, on the web. 
And then um, Michelle had a question about does man-made noise in the ocean bother whales? And I think you might be getting into that in our next um, section. So maybe that would be a good uh, segue into our next section. Yes, that is a great question. So hold on to that because that is that's going to play a big role in this um, in our presentation as we keep going. All right. So should I go on to the next one? Sure. Okay, thanks for all those great questions, you guys. So let's talk about how whales talk. So toothed whales like orcas and sperm whales have a melon. And you can see it right there in that little image. And sometimes they use it to focus their sounds during echolocation. Um, other animals that use echolocation, an example would be like bats, right? And that echolocation is helping them to establish what's around them. And they often use this in hunting. Toothed whales are thought to produce sounds by passing air through both their trachea and their, um, which is part of their throat, and then their phonic lips, which there's an arrow there showing you, and the phonic lips are air sacs around the blowhole. Baleen whales, like our humpback whale, are a little more complicated. Baleen whales don't have a melon, so we don't think they use their sound for echolocation. Baleen whales are a bit of a mystery to scientists, in fact, because they, although they have a larynx, they don't have any vocal cords. And when they sing, bubbles are not released from their, from their blowholes. So um, scientists are actually still trying to figure all of that out, um, this mystery of these baleen whales. But different types of baleen whales produce different sounds. For example, gray whales have a call, which is a repetitive sequence that follows a pattern, whereas the North Atlantic right whale hums repeatedly. Humpback whales, however, are known for their complex vocalizations that are similar to a song. And we're gonna get to listen to a humpback song in just a little bit. So hold on for that, because it's pretty amazing. Whale vocalizations vary in intensity, wavelength, frequency, and pattern based on the behavior and purpose of the sound. Low frequency sounds are usually called grunts and moans and pulses and tones, kind of like a cello, and are normally produced by baleen whales. High frequency sounds are usually called clicks and whistles and squeaks, um, a little bit more like a violin. And those are normally produced by toothed whales. Humans only hear sounds between a set of frequencies where our human speech is centered. So some very low frequency and high frequency whale vocalizations may not be audible to the human ear. So now that we understand how whales make those sounds, mostly, and we learned about some of the sounds they make, let's consider how their sounds travel in the ocean or in liquid versus how sound travels in other forms of matter, including solid and gas. So like we mentioned, vocalization happens through vibrations, sound waves traveling from molecule to molecule. Now sound travels best through solids because those molecules are so close together. And as the molecules spread out in different states of matter, they're a little bit further apart in water or liquid, and then they're even further apart in gas, it becomes harder for sound to travel from molecule to molecule. So it might just take a little bit longer versus that solid where it's got molecules are right next to each other. So it just passes through quickly. If you look at this picture of a tuning fork partially um, submerged in water, you can see how the waves are moving outward from the tuning fork. We experience how sounds travel through air when we listen to noise. We can even sometimes feel it travel through solids, like how we felt the vibrations from our humming or saying our names. So in this image of a tuning fork partially submerged in water, we can see how waves travel through liquid. You can see how those sound, wave, sound waves are making ripples in the surface of the water. So now that you've seen how sound waves travel through different states of matter, it's time to talk about how humpback whales um, produce sound, use and produce sound. So humpback whales, it's at, they're actually my favorite whale, are found throughout the world's ocean and they are probably probably one of the most well-known of baleen whales. 
they're very acrobatic. So we get to see them doing all of these wonderful acrobats, breaching and peck slaps and fluke slaps. Um, and then they're best known for their vocalizations, a series of complex and repeating sequences with this characteristics of a song. Songs are these repetitive sequences and they can last between 20 minutes to several hours. Let's go ahead and listen to a song right now. So I am just gonna pull up this first song for us. Let me see. Just gonna take a minute here. Sorry, it always takes me a minute to find my... couple of folks on the line saying that it sounds like Dory. All right. Um, I think that is such a cool sound. I guess I should make sure can everyone oh good we're back to my screen. Um, yeah, so it does sound like Dory, right? Dory actually uh, really had nailed whale talk, I think we can say. So um, we just listened to a song and this song was actually collected from a listening station right out here in Olympic Coast. Um, we just listened to that song right now, but the image you were looking at while that song was being played is um, kind of a graph, a visual representation of what we're hearing. And we're gonna talk about those graphs in just a little bit. Um, but male humpbacks are the ones to produce these songs. Recent scientific experiments have found humpback whale males singing in all parts of their migration route. Scientists used to think that humpbacks only sang in their winter breeding grounds because that is where they heard them sing. However, not only have whales been heard singing in winter breeding grounds like Hawaii and Mexico, but they're also heard now singing in summer feeding grounds like Monterey Bay and Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. I was really excited. The very first time I heard that sound was last summer. And for me, it was thrilling to hear a humpback whale singing in Olympic Coast. But where do they sing the most? Humpback whale males still sing the most in those warm breeding waters, like those found near Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary and Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument. They vocalize a lot during breeding. And just as a reminder though, females do vocalize, especially for communicating with young or during feeding as a group. Um, and feeding generally happens in those cooler, more productive areas of the ocean, like the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. All righty, so um, now we're gonna watch a short video. It's about four minutes to learn about whale songs and the types of scientists that study them and some of the technology that they use. So I'm gonna pull that video up really quick. Here we go. Everything in the ocean is producing some form of sound. I'm Christopher Clark. I'm a bioacoustic scientist, and I listen to the songs of life around this planet. 
listen to this expanse of the sound in the ocean, it just becomes a magnificent symphony of voices. And you know what? Most of the voices that we're listening to today, we do not know who's making those sounds. My name is Ann Allen. I'm a research oceanographer for NOAA Fisheries. We use acoustics or sound in order to help us monitor the whales and dolphins in the Pacific Islands. Pretty early on, I realized that a lot of the methods that have been developed so far were not going to work for our data. Somebody would literally sit here and scan through a few hours at a time, marking each of these start and ends of the humpback song. Hi, my name's Matt Harvey. I'm a software engineer at Google, and I work on machine learned models for audio analysis applied to bioacoustics. Some species like fin whales make very simple sounds, and our detectors are actually pretty good at those. But then species like humpback whales make very complex sound types that are changing all the time. So having a detector that works for those sounds is very, very difficult. The idea with machine learning is you train a machine learning model, which is actually teaching a computer to recognize sounds rather than teaching it a step-by-step -step process. And this is humpback whale, this is humpback whale, this is not humpback whale, ignore this. We learned to predict the presence of humpback whale with very high accuracy. So it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's doing what it's supposed to do. Woo. There's not a lot known about our whale populations out here, so there's so much that we could figure out just from knowing who's where and when collected all this data, we don't want to just hoard it. We want to put it out there so that other people can use it and look at it. When I heard the first audios of underwater recording, I was amazed by that world that we typically don't hear, and I wanted to share that with more people. Hi, my name is Jonas, and I'm a creative technologist at Google. So the data you see is all visualized here as a spectrogram. When you zoom all the way in, you would see a few minutes of audio and you can see the patterns of the different whale calls. And as you zoom out, you would be able to see several months of audio at the same time on the screen. And at the bottom, you see a long bar that is a heat map. So using the AI to guide you where to look for whales. It's absolutely critical that we learn to share. What you're doing is you're actually allowing a vista into a world that's been totally hidden from us. sounds in data sets that we don't know what they are. We've seen that releasing a large data set just creates opportunities that we had never thought about. People might take this project and make discoveries that no one else has done before. You're opening up the opportunity to explore it to everybody. Are you not going to have 10 people or even 100 people? You're going to have 10 million people. That's the scale we need to understand life in the ocean. All right, hopefully um, that in has inspired some of you guys to maybe become some bioacoustic engineers and start helping to study all that sound in the ocean. And just for clarification, I put into the chat box that AI is short for artificial intelligence. And we also use the term machine learning when we're looking at using computers to look at patterns in data like, like whale sounds. Yeah, machine learning is a great way to say it, actually. We are um, teaching these machines, right? And then they're helping us. So um, before we go into the next section, so uh, we've I've, I've thrown a lot of information at you guys. And this next section, we're going to put on our science hats. And we are going to be the scientists that kind of try and decipher and interpret some of these um, sound graphs or spectrograms. Um, but I want to make sure we have a chance to ask a few questions, if you guys have any, before we move on.
Okay, so Weston and Shane was, were wondering, um, how come walls can block sounds if solids conduct, conduct sounds the best? Wow, that is a really good question. Um, I mean, I, I don't know that walls totally stop sounds. I'll just use my home as an example. I can certainly hear my cat meowing outside of my bedroom, <laughs> even though she is um, behind a closed door and a wall. So I think it depends if you, um, I don't know, that's a great question. I totally, I can't give you guys a, a total answer for that, but I'm gonna write that down and see if I can't find a better um, explanation for you. And I, I think another another option when we don't really know the answer is that you guys could compose a question and Google it and see whether you can find some information on um, walls blocking sounds versus solids conducting sounds. Uh, but they, uh, Weston and Shane also had another question, um, whether it's possible to hear whale songs above the water or do you have to be underwater to hear, hear them without special equipment? So um, without special equipment, I know, I know that people have just been swimming in areas off Hawaii where they've been able to hear those whale sounds, even though the whales could be quite a distance from them. I would imagine it would depend where you were located as to whether or not you could hear some of those sounds the whales were making um, right below you. Although, I don't know if any of you have ever been on a whale watching boat, um, but you know, even with the motors off, they'll stick a, a good whale watching crew will will sit and stick a um, hydrophone into the water underneath the ship, and that's the only way that we can hear those sounds. Even though sometimes whales are passing right underneath those boats at that point, so I do not know of the ability to hear whale sounds above water. Okay. Um, so Jason David had wanted to know how deep do you usually find humpback whales that sing? Like how deep in the water? So um, I know just from some of the researchers I've talked to that they can be as deep as, um, you know, 100 feet or more, uh, 30 to, to 60 meters even. Um, humpback whales usually can only stay underwater for, usually they have to come up for breath because they're mammals, so they breathe air, right? So they usually have to come up and take a breath every 30 to 40 minutes or so. Um, so they can't be too deep, although they can dive pretty deep if they need to. Um, but then when they're feeding, they're often surface feeding. And so they would not be very deep at all and still making a lot of vocalizations and sometimes singing in those waters. Right. Um, so uh, we have a question about um, tooth and baleen whales. I'm going to hang on to that until just before we go into the next section, because I know you're going to talk about that a little bit. But um, Harper and Connor had wanted to know how big are baby humpback whales? Oh, that's a great question. So humpback whales, adult humpback whales, um, tend to be about 45 to 50 feet long. So if you think of the size of a school bus, um, that's about how long an adult humpback whale is. And humpback whales have these the longest flippers in the marine world, right? And those are 15 feet long, each of their flippers. Um, and the humpback baby, when it comes out, a, a newborn humpback baby tends to be about 15 feet long. So like a third of the, the mom's body, roughly. Great. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask this, this one question that Mylon had, which is why do toothed whales have higher voices than non-toothed whales? And I think that you're going to get into a little bit of the differences here. So you can either answer that really quickly and then go on into your next section or hold on to that question to go to the next section. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to hold on to it. Although, you know, I think a lot of it just has to do with the way that those sounds are produced in their bodies. You know, if we remember those toothed whales have those phonic lips and the, their, um, the noise is actually using those phonic lips. And I think that that plays a role in the tone of the whale vocalizations at that point versus these baleen whales who aren't using their blowhole bubbles don't come out when they make noise and so that noise is coming from somewhere deeper inside their body which um, could give us some explanation as to the differences in those sounds but we are going to go into listening to some of the sounds and listening to the differences between the toothed whales and the humpback whales so i think we'll go right into our next session okay 
So we're gonna dive in now to this last part of the presentation. You guys are going to be sound scientists. So whale researchers use equipment to monitor whale vocalization that was originally used by the Navy to detect submarines. So remember how we said we can't hear some sounds that whales make really because we're our sound is centered around human speech. So we only have this, you know, general area of sound waves that we can hear. So tones that are higher and tones that are lower sometimes fall outside of that um, ability for humans to hear. So a spectrogram, which is what we have here, allows us to see those sounds that we can't hear. So to do this, scientists collect data through these submerged hydrophones, and then they monitor the sounds using software that allows them to create a spectrogram like the one you see here. And these are visual representations of the frequency, duration, and intensity of a sound as it changes um, through time. So all those things we've talked about so far are represented on these spectrograms. And we can also call these voice prints or voice grams. Um, so let's talk about how we read a spectrogram. So our first step is learning how to read the spectrogram graphs, right? So you guys can understand what's happening and what you're listening to. So here is an example of a spectrogram graph, and you can see it's a humpback whale. So the horizontal axis, that horizon, is the x-axis. And then the vertical axis is the y-axis. And in this graph, the x-axis represents time elapsed, so the amount of time we're listening to the sound. And the y-axis represents the frequency in thousands of hertz. So on our y-axis, one is actually 1,000 hertz. Now, when we listen to the spectrogram, because I'm going to play you guys the sound that's associated with spectrogram, and you're going to be able to see it, um, they've made this one really easy for us to read, because there's going to be a pink line that's going to pass across the spectrogram and it's going to indicate when and which sounds we're hearing. So I'm going to pull up that spectrogram really quick and we are going to have a chance to listen to our spectrogram and watch the sound. So let me see here. There we go. Sorry, sometimes that play button just eludes me there. Just be patient. Sorry about this, guys. All right, so um, hopefully you guys were able to hear that. So that was a humpback whale um, that we listened to. And hopefully you could see that pink line as it went across. Now, before I go back to my presentation, I'm going to pull up one more um, sound for you. And so we just listened to our humpback whale. And now we're going to listen to an orca whale. So remember that humpback whale held those really low moans, right? And this, and if you remember, we listened to a humpback whale earlier, and that was a song. And hopefully when you listen to that song, you guys notice some of the repetition that we had. And so here's an orca. It's going to take me a minute to get it to play.
Okay, so you guys got to hear both the humpback whale and the orca whale, right? And remember that we mentioned that those humpback whale has those low grunts and moans, and then this orca whale had these really high pitched squeaks and whistles. Um, so it's uh, very easy to hear the difference between these baleen whales and these toothed whales. And I do think a lot of it has to do with this, the tone of the sound and the high pitch has to do with the way they make those sounds. All right, so now that you guys have heard both a baleen whale and a toothed whale in relation to the spectrogram, I'm going to play you guys a sound that's associated with the spectrogram that you see right here. Um, and your job is gonna figure out how many species of whales were recorded in this spectrogram. So I'm gonna give you three choices. Is it one whale, is it two whales, or is it three whales? So I'm gonna pull up the video and as you're listening to it, please put into the question box whether you think the spectrogram represents one whale, two whales, or three whales. So that is gonna come up in just a second. Okay, so be ready, put in that question box, one whale, two whales, or three whales. <laughs> Okay, so the, the guesses are pouring in. Um, I can see that Juliet was thinking two with a question mark. Finn was thinking two. Dory and Evelyn were thinking two. Anne was thinking three. Um, Kiram and Kiefer were thinking two. So most of the people are thinking two, although Carson thinks three. Um, Charlie thinks um, two. Weston and Shane think three. Harper and Connor think three. Um, Theodore thinks three or four. Um, so it looks like most people are thinking that there are multiple whales, but it's a question of whether it's two or three. Oh, and Wyatt nice th thinks that it's one. Oh, <laughs> it's a multi-talented whale. Um, nice job, you guys. It is multiple whales. And for this spectrogram, it's actually two whales, two species of whales. So this is a humpback that we first hear that kind of I'm um, not super low, but still the low moan um, that we're hearing. And you can kind of see it represented on this spectrogram with some of these images down here lower on that lower frequency hertz. And then the second whale is actually almost sounds like footsteps, if you guys heard that. And that is a sperm whale echolocating. So well done, you guys. Two whales on this one, the humpback whale and the sperm whale. All right, so now I'm gonna test you guys again. So now that you've, um, you've heard, so you've now heard how to um, match, you know, you matched this number of whales to the spectrogram. You've listened to baleen whales, you've listened to toothed whales. Um, so now I want you to try and match the sound that I'm gonna play for you to these two spectrograms. But before I do this, I want you to take a good look at these spectrograms. Because when I play you guys the sound, you're not gonna see the spectrograms. You're just gonna be looking at a lovely picture of the ocean, but you're gonna be hearing a whale sound in the background. So let's make some quick observations about these spectrograms. So you have spectrogram A, and um, spectrogram A seems to have some lower pulses and moans down there. And then we have spectrogram B, which looks like it's gonna have some higher pitched noises. So take a look at those really kind of tell the difference spectrogram A or spectrogram B because you're only going to see the picture of the ocean. You're not going to see the pictures of these spectrograms. And then while the sound is playing, if you guys think you know whether the sound we're listening to matches spectrogram A or spectrogram B, please put it into the question box. And here comes that next sound.
Okay, that was a it's, a, right. it's a short sound. Are we getting answers, Lisa? We have, we have a bunch of smart people in our audience. Um, they are all Juliet, Westerman, and Shane, Theodore, Charlie, Finn, Anne, Arthur, um, Kiriman, Kiefer, and Wyatt, and Victoria. They're all saying A. Carson is saying A as well. Chayton is saying A. Michelle is saying A. So, so what do you think? A, correct. Oops. Great job, you guys. The correct answer is spectrogram A. You really heard those low tones coming in, right? So this is, um, we were listening to a spectrogram that was representing the North Atlantic right whale, which is a baleen whale. So it has those lower pitch and hums to vocalize. So great job. Um, so an interesting story about these right whales is that technology that captures sounds can really be helpful in the conservation of whales. So this North Atlantic right whale is one of the world's most endangered large species, whale species. It's found on the east coast of the US and these whales are extremely vulnerable to ship vessel strikes. So Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, which is off the coast of Massachusetts, has these underwater monitors called Marine Autonomous Recording Units or Mar MARUs. And they pick up North Atlantic right whale vocalizations and it sends out alerts to nearby boaters to slow down and avoid accidentally hitting a whale. And that is helping to keep this North Atlantic right whale um, safe from some of those human interactions on the ocean. So great job, you guys. So I wanna take you back really quick to Olympic Coast because in Olympic Coast, we are part of the um, Sanctuary Sound Project. And the Sync Sound Project is a four-year project managed by NOAA and the US Navy to better understand underwater sound within national marine sanctuaries. So this map of Olympic Coast um, here, hopefully you recognize the boundary of that outline from our map earlier. Um, and on this map are four listening stations and they're collecting ocean sound data in our sanctuary. So that very first whale song that we played, that humpback whale song, that was captured right up here in OCO2. And um, this, this listening station out here at OCO2, up there at that northern part of our sanctuary is actually in the shipping lanes and pretty close to this very productive and popular Swiftsure Bank area along the boundary of US and Canadian waters. It's a highly active, high use area for both um, ocean animals and humans. So as you can imagine, humans and animals interact quite a bit up here. Um, so I'm going to play another sound for you that was also captured from this station showing a humpback whale vocalizations that are associated with feeding. So the first one we heard was a sound that was associated with um, a song. So a singing, a humpback whale male singing. This time we are going to listen to a humpback whale feeding. And I know we're running out of time, so I'm gonna try and hurry. All right, I just think these sounds are so cool. Um, let me see here, get back to my presentation. So hopefully you guys were able to notice that um, that first song we listened to at the very beginning of the very first sound was definitely the 
um, song, that repetitive, and then there is a difference with the humpback whale feeding sound. And also, if you notice, um, spectrograms look different. Sometimes they can be very hard to read and interpret. And there was a lot of background noise happening. So like I said, this is a really busy area up there in, in that OCO2 area of the Olympic Coast listening stations. And so it could pick up, you know, weather is going to show up on there. Other boat activity is going to show up on there. Turns out fish make noises, snapping shrimp are deafening. Um, so there's all sorts of sounds that these sound scientists have to navigate through to really understand what it is they're listening to. Um, I'm gonna skip this one for now so we can get to this very last sound. I want you guys to listen to this last sound and tell me what you think it is. Um, and then we'll hopefully have a couple minutes left for questions. All right, we've got a lot of guesses um, pouring in here. Um, Theodore and Joel thought that it might be a boat noise. Um, Joel also was suggesting maybe it's jet skis. Um, Stacy was saying a chainsaw. Weston and Shane were guessing that maybe it was waves crashing. Um, Victoria was saying that it sounds like a boat or waves, maybe with a whale in the background. And um, Laura was saying not singing, maybe mating or eating. There are a lot of people who are saying that it was a boat. Um, Jason, yes. and Jason and David were saying that. Uh, Theodora was saying that it's very loud. White was saying a boat. Anna is saying a ship. So, yeah, there's a lot of different um, guesses, but most of them, I think that uh, probably the majority of them are saying some kind of a boat. Nice, nicely done, you guys. It is a really unique sound. I actually loved the chainsaw. I thought that was very clever. I've had other people suggest a train, but that sound was a small boat. Um, and I think this is a good representation because just one small boat creates a lot of sound. And so it's so important to remember that we share the ocean with other creatures and that we can affect how those creatures like whales communicate. Someone asked earlier in the presentation, um, does human activity affect these whales and their ability to communicate? Yes, it does. So really quick, let's wrap up. I'm so sorry, I'm like taking every last second, but um, so let's just, cover what we did. We, cetaceans like humpbacks and orcas vocalize, right? Meaning they create sound to communicate. Baleen whales like the humpback make those low frequency sounds, while toothed whales like the orca make high frequency sounds. Humpback whales sing while they are in the warmer waters like um, for winter, like Hawaii and Mexico, but scientists are also finding that they sing in their feeding areas as well. And most importantly, remember that we share the ocean with other creatures and we contribute to ocean noise just like that small boat. And these noises can affect how whales communicate. And hopefully we have a minute for questions before we have to say goodbye to you guys. All right. Uh, well, we do have some questions. I, I think we only have time for one. So Karim and Kiefer have been very patient about their question. They were, were wondering, um, can, can whales sing above water? And if so, what would it sound like? That is a cool question. I love that idea, but um, I, I do not know of any example of a whale singing above water. In fact, in Hawaii, when these humpback whales do, where they do most of their singing, you'll often find that humpback whales will point themselves down. So they'll actually be um, head down, tail up underwater conducting that singing or often on their side. So to my knowledge, no, whales do not sing above the water. But they do was, vocalize uh, with peck slaps and tail fluke slaps and stuff. 
And I was actually thinking about some of the dolphin sounds. Some of the dolphins can vocalize above water because I know that I've seen, well, there used to be this television show called Flipper where you'd see the, yes. the dolphin, the bottlenose dolphin vocalizing. So, so it sounds like some vocalizations might be able to be heard above water, but yeah, for the most maybe part- maybe toothed whales, especially yeah. where if they're using that blowhole and those phonic lips. Right, so, so things to think about, and that is also something that you can Google and find out more about because there's a lot of information about um, vocalizations of different types of marine mammals. So thank you so much, Nicole, for sharing such a wealth of information about um, whale vocalizations. There's a lot in there that I did not realize. So thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. And um, thank you to our audience for tuning in. This is the last of our NOAA Science Camp webinars for this year. Um, we, we probably will be starting up some, some kind of webinar series in the fall, but Nicole's um, office, the, off, the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuaries does a regular web, uh, re regular seminar series. And so if you're interested in signing up for any of their webinars, go to the o Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary website and they will have some, some information there about their, their seminar series. So thank you very much. And um, thank you, Nicole. Thank you to our audience. And we will have a good summer. Have a good summer and we'll see you back in the fall. Thank you guys. It was really fun. Glad you all came.